Everything is perfect. So Klaus, if you like, you can start. Stage is yours. Okay, thank you. So okay. Share my screen. Okay, so my name is Klaus Karcher. Uh, my topic for today is multispectral line scan applications in a sustainable industrial world. Um, I'm a project manager at Commerzens. Commerzens uh, is a manufacturer of uh, machine vision components and solutions. And the special focus is on line scan imaging. We are part of the DKH group, so also Allied Vision will, will have a session later, which is part of the same group, basically. Yeah, in my role as project manager, I'm responsible for the Svir camera line we are just launched, so, so it's a pretty new product. Uh, but of course, I will also tell about some additional uh, uh, components we can provide to make round solutions, more or less complete solutions. So first and short overview, um, uh, I want to be uh, give it a little bit more general uh, introduction on uh, challenges on the road to a sustainable future uh, and some main topics. I don't want to, to address all uh, applications for SWIR cameras or for multispectral and hyperspectral imaging because of course, we have also other presenters, so I'm, I'm touching only some of the applications. Uh, one is for sure an important topic is waste prevention and recycling. Um, so applications here are waste and plastic sorting. Another important topic is food and agriculture, so efficient production of food, um, which mainly affects uh, seed and food sorting. And another topic uh, which touches renewable energy or in general semiconductor and solar cell manufacturing process control and inspection. Next topic is, or uh, next block more, this is uh, some basics. I thought because I'm, I'm the first presenter, I should maybe give some, some more basic introductions into the topics. I think from other presenters, we will hear more details and more in-depth information. Um, so very general, what is SWIR, multispectral versus hyperspectral, typical applications, uh, and so a rough com comparison of the most common imaging systems. Uh, so line scan, area scan, and hyperspectral images, which are typically push boom systems, so very similar to line scan. And I will want to give an overview of the uh, components and systems we, are, uh, we, we have available for you. And uh, we'll conclude with a short summary at the end. So um, first block challenges on the road to a sustainable future. Um, uh, and focus on, the, on this, the plastic topic. And one very yeah, alarming figure maybe for, for, for one or the other, the growth of global plastic production from 1950 to 2014 was 20 times. So in 1950, uh, well, 2040, we produced 20 times as much plastic as in 1950. And about 40% of all plastic materials turn into waste in less than a month. And this is not only a problem for the environment and for the for the oceans and for the fishes and for the one who eats the fish later, <laughs> but also it's a, it's a simply an economic topic. So because ninety five percent of the plastic packaging material value, which is around eighty to one hundred twenty billion U S dollar annually, is lost to the economic uh, after a short first use. So one uh, important thing that uh, SWIR imaging can do in this case and hyperspectral imaging and multispectral imaging is help uh, identifying and sorting recyclable plastic 
and other waste materials. So another very important topic for us um, is the uh, food production because yeah, we have already several customers in this area and, and yeah, uh, I think it's an important topic for us because it's a, it's a basically line scan application as well. Um, uh, when it comes to sorting of seeds, fruits and vegetables. So, so um, one reason is to detect contaminants like like uh, stones or nutshells. When, for example, when you're, when you're looking for nuts and you want to remove the nutshells uh, or sorting out products with damages like, like bruises on apples or something like this. So line scan applications are typically for, for fast moving and uh, smaller objects. So the, these uh, objects like apples or even bigger fruits are sometimes better with uh, area scan applications. So the topic, renew renewable energy or semiconductor inspection. One very important feature is of silicon is that it becomes transparent in the infrared region. So, so around 1000 nanometer, it becomes more or less or more and more transparent. Uh, and this uh, gives the chance to look through the semiconductor materials of, uh, and see defects like cracks or voids or delaminations or to, to inspect uh, metal structures inside the, the semiconductor structure, right? inside the silicon vapor or solar cell. Solar cells also, so solar cell inspection is, a, is an important topic for us. Yeah? So now I go to the basic section. I think most of you are already aware with, about the, the, the infrared. Uh, reach which is more or less to check into the to the visible light range and it's much wider than in terms of wavelengths than the, the, the visible range. Um, there is no really fixed or sharp border between near infrared, short wave infrared. Uh, so, so some some uh, take this 1.4 micrometer as, as the border because this is an important wavelength because there's a uh, absorption maximum of water in this region. So this is some some people uh, define this as the beginning of the short wave infrared. Others define the near infrared uh, even wider up to 2,500 micrometers. So there is no really sharp gaps, but, but typically two, two and a half or three micrometers is end of the short wave infrared or end of course of the near infrared region where uh, and then mid wave and long wave infrared uh, region comes out. So, uh, I already mentioned silicon becomes increasingly transparent above 1000 nanometers approximately. So, um, this is also no good material for, for image sensors, of course, anymore. So, we need uh, different semiconductor materials for sphere image sensors which absorb photons in this wavelength range and convert them efficiently into neutrons. So what you see here is a, is a typical silicon sensor and a standard, more or less standard uh, INGAS sensor. So INGAS is the, the uh, uh, short form of indium gallium arsenide, which is, is a, a, a the most common material for shortwave image sensors. There are also other options, but these are the, are the most common ones. And uh, the spectral sensitivity range depends on the composition of the alloy and uh, for the parameters like cooling and so on. So the standard response range for most indoor sensors is approximately 900 to 1,700 uh, nanometers. Uh, there are short wavelength enhanced types which go down to 500 micrometers uh, nanometers or some extended uh, sensors which go up to 1.9 micrometer or even uh, cool this is these are typically cooled sensors not available for for standard line scan or area scan uh, applications but rather for spectrometers which go up to 2.5 micrometers. 
So here's another uh, comparison more or less about um, um, the human eye response is this, this gray line which we see here. Then the, the red line is more or less a typical near infrared LED, which you can still use for silicon sensors. But as soon as you go to Inga sensors, you need also different light sources. So um, as a light source for, for uh, sphere applications, there is still halogen very, uh, very in use because um, especially hyperspectral Im uh, imaging need also broadband illumination. So this is one of the, the easiest and cheapest way to, to, to produce uh, decent broadband illumination, but of course it has also several disadvantages like durability and maintenance effort. It's hot, it's high energy consumption, and maybe the, the most important thing is uh, uh, there is no flash operation for, for halogen lamps. Um, flash operation is really something very important. I will uh, go to it later. Here you can see some of the available shortwave infrared LEDs. Um, yeah, we have, these are more or less the standard uh, uh, we have for our line scan illuminations. There are others on request available. Um, now I go to some typical plastic uh, samples uh, where you can see uh, choosing the right wavelengths or combination of wavelengths is really key to success. When you, when you image something like this with the broadband illumination and a broadband sensor, you will have no success and you, you cannot tell about part D spectra because what you scan is more or less the, the, the integral of, over the overall wavelengths and this is there's pretty less uh, difference between, for example, the yellow and the red curve. Or, but when you select uh, certain wave bands, you can see clearly the differences between them. And typically, you need more than just one wavelength. And the more materials you, you want to tell apart, the, the more uh, bands you also need. So uh, also a topic where most might be also already aware of. But it's the difference between multispectral and hyperspectral imaging. So uh, hyperspectral imaging typically means uh, narrow spectral bands over a continuous spectral range, let's say from 900 to 700 nanometers and 100 bands or something like this, which makes an H nanometer half with for each band. Uh, and what you get for every pixel you have scanned, a continuous complete spectrum. While multispectral image, uh, typically is, has a lower spectral resolution. So you don't have so hundreds of bands, but, but only a few. Sometimes uh, or these, these bands are not necessarily continuous or equidistant and sometimes even overlapping. So typically RGB bands are overlapping strongly. So, um, but of course there are also applications where you only need two or three narrow band uh, channels to tell apart certain uh, materials. Hyperspectral imaging can be considered as a special case of spectral imaging where often hundreds of, of continuous spectral bands are available. So now um, I want to tell a little bit about the basics of diff different uh, ways to catch images. So, um, so the, most of you might be aware of, of line scan acquisition where you typically the, 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 the scan line by line. So you have to move the original of the camera uh, and then you scan one band and one line at a time. Um, so this is also called push boom imaging because yeah, yeah, the operation is more or less clear. I think when you use a push probe, it's, it's a similar process. Contrast is area scan, um, where complete, complete uh, frames are captured. So in one uh, exposure, you have a, a complete frame captured. But of course, as long as you don't have a matrix sensor like an RGB biomatrix sensor or something like this, you capture only one band per acquisition. Um, 
while hyperspectral scans uh, scanner is again typically a, a push boom application so you scan one line at a time uh, but this line is split it into a spectrum more or less so for each pixel of the image you you get a complete spectrum so on one axis you have you have more or less uh, along the sensor you have the, the spatial resolution and the other axis of the sensor is the uh, spectral resolution so you basically use also an area sensor but make a line scan application out of it uh, and you capture hundreds of bands per line per acquisition. So maybe, yeah, advantages, disadvantages of different uh, 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 systems. Line scan imaging is capturing line by line, uh, but with very high speed. So, so typically we have 40 kilo lines per second. Uh, and also a relatively high spectral resolution. So the standard sensor is 1K by one pixel. Typical area uh, uh, sensors are small, have smaller resolutions and they produce like 100 frames per second. They are, of course, they are faster sensors, also uh, slower, but these are rough uh, typical figures. Hyperspectral uh, images uh, are much, much slower. So, so it's a factor of 40 more or less or, or even more so it's these thousand of lines per second so you reach typically not the full spectral resolution but only like 100 bands and you are still 40 times slower than with a, with a line scan camera uh, but of course you have captured 100 bands spectrum with 100 bands so Advantages, disadvantages, spatial resolution of line scan is high, of course. Areas can typically be a little bit lower, um, hyperspectral as well. Um, spectral resolution is low, typically only one band, as long as you don't make special tricks, I will explain later. And also for the area scan, the spectral resolution is low and also restricted for, for to some, as long as you don't have a biometrics or something in front of the sensor, you have to capture uh, images one after another with, with different light sources, for example. But of course, the, the, the samples must not move during the, the acquisitions. Otherwise, you, you know, the images don't fit together. Uh, spectral resolution of hyperspectral is high. Um, yeah, flexibility is a, is a uh, difference. Hyperspectral um, sensors are simply you can select the bands you need, so they are more flexible in contrast to the others. Um, but of course, the speed is much lower. Um, you need definitely a broadband line illumination for hyperspectral in, uh, images, while others can use. Uh, uh, so, so line illumination, of course, for both line systems, for both push prune systems, for the areas can you need, you have to uh, uh, enlighten uh, the, the complete scene or the complete frame you capture. So, um, two minutes left. Okay. So, the typical applications for, for line scan are industrial applications where bike material like seeds or plastic flakes or something like this move on a conveyor belt or fall down simply. Continuous inspection of web or sheet fit material. Areas can, can uh, only capture or you know, better for, for capture objects one after, after the other. And um, hyperspectral images, because of the low speed uh, are, and the high flexibility, are rather used for uh, feasibility studies or lab use. So now I want to at least start giving a short overview of, of our products. So we have a whole range of lines and cameras. I cannot cover all of them. The most important is probably this short -life infrared, 1K or 512 resolution 12.5 or 25 micrometer square pixels 40 kilohertz line frequency um, 
standard uh, spectral range 950 to 1700 nanometers. Um, data interface is either peak e vision or camera link. We have a standard C mount on it, but other options are also on request. The camera is pretty small. Further information are on the web page. Of course, you can uh, take a look there. Important suite, uh, features uh, we have um, in, internal DSNU uh, co correction and PNU correction, so photo response and dark signal, non uniform you can, can be corrected internally. We have gamma correction and, and other image processing internally. Um, we have a high sensitive mode, so you can bin pixels as well. And we can use external line and frame, frame and acquisition triggers also to flash synchronously with the, with the line scan. So this is the, the, the approach to have multispectral SWIR images. And of course, we can uh, synchronize multi, multiple cameras when the, the field of view has to be wider than the field of view of the camera. You can simply use uh, several cameras side by side. We offer also SWIR lenses and illumination with up to three different wavelengths per second. Um, separately adjustable and flashable. So you can also have like three wavelengths in one illumination. It's modular. So one typical or one application where I uh, have shown here an hyperspectral scan because this is always a good starting point to select the right wavelengths. When you now scan these two bands, for example, with two different LEDs, you get these images. When you subtract them, there is still you see you know, some difference, and but now when you make some image processing thresholding and overlaying, you see there are foil fibers in this cotton, so plastic fibers in the cotton, uh, which of course are impurities and which can be detected only in the sewer. They are fairly visible in the in the. In the we also have uh, RGB plus, plus near infrared cameras. Um, I can't go too much into detail, but this is also a, a TDI sensor where, where you can uh, read out TDI color plus near infrared. So, so we have the RGB plus one near infrared channel. We have a lot of different light for, for, for all kinds of situations like backlight, dark field, diffuse lights, coaxial, bright field light. We have even options like uh, wide spectrum illumination, also hyperspectral imaging, so, so with up to eight channels and so some different LED spectra. This can also be pulsed and time multiplexed for, for multispectral imaging. And here's one typical application for another, yet another camera, which is a this near infrared camera with two lenses. So the, the, they, it captures uh, and uh, this image and a near infrared image side by side on the sensor, but at the same at the same time. So you, you uh, what we did is was an inline banknote inspection system where we catch the near infrared uh, uh, image in transmissive mode, and at the same time in the same field of view, uh, RGB reflective image. Uh, what you can see here is the. The RGB image where you check the offset and the tidal print of the of the bank nodes. In the near infrared image, the, the, the normal offset print was, uh, is more or less invisible, and you can you can see the watermarks and security thread much clearer in there. And at the beginning of the sheet, we capture also for a short moment only with UV illumination to detect the fluorescent uh, security fibers in the, in the paper. Hi. Yeah. Okay. I think that's basically everything. Um, one small note, as you might have seen, we are not only offering cameras and lenses and, and illumination, but also complete scanning solutions with, with several cameras and illumination for, for example, for inline uh, applications on request. Okay. That's it from my side. Now it's probably not too much time for questions left anymore. Um, I think we, uh, as we're running out of time, I see mm -hmm. some questions. We will skip them to the end after the last presentation. Mm -hmm.
But uh, there's a question for you, Klaus. Um, what are the <coughs> typical EQE peak width uh, requirements for multispectral sphere image sensors? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, fits good into the topic. It, <laughs> um, short answer, it depends. <laughs> so, it really depends, it depends a lot on the application there. And uh, there might be applications where you can even combine, let's say, one wide wider band with one narrow band to 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 filter out some some certain peak if if this is the the, the important peak you need for your application in general yeah so leds typically have have a half width of, of 100 nanometers 80 150 depends a little bit on the wavelengths the longer the wavelength the wider the, the, the half width um this is for some applications pretty Pretty good for for other applications. You even have to narrow down it with with uh, bandpass filters. Mm -hmm. So there is no uh, general answer, but of course the the wider uh, the beam the the, the, the spectral uh, the spectrum is you have, the easier it is to saturate the sensor and you get a decent signal to noise ratio. Mm -hmm. There's a question about your line scan or about line scan based systems. Uh, what uh, is the main limitation of these systems? Um, yeah, compared to hyperspectral uh, images, of course, the, the spectral resolution. If you want to have more bands, you have to uh, you need flashed illumination, and, and uh, yeah, you can compensate for this. This is maybe the, the, the most good look point compared to hyperspectral uh, images. Yeah, for, for in comparison to area scan, yeah, there are some applications which are better for area scan and some for better for line scan. So, so there is, yeah, also this depends on the application. So. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> so word of the day, apparently. <laughs> um, a question, I think, to all of you. Um, how do you see the involvement in SWIR technology over the coming years? What will be next? Nothing, or it depends. I think we will see some new uh, SWIR sensor technologies, which are not necessarily bound to Ingers, which might also de uh, cause a price decrease, but. Uh, on the other hand, we, we hear of these sensors for many, many years, but uh, we don't see them until now. Usually, the question, right? So I have to say thanks, first of all, to the people who make uh, these present wonderful presentations. Also to all the listeners, you will receive a link with a recorded video, I think, uh, tomorrow morning. Next week, there will be another webinar. Then it's about illumination. If you have any questions, you can get in contact with all these companies here. Hope to see you next week. Please stay healthy and see you. Bye.